Page 386, The Family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Good to be in the Lord's house. You can be seated. Good to be in the Lord's house this morning. If you're glad to be here, say amen. 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 Good to see all of you here. If you're visiting with us today, you're an honored guest. We praise the Lord for you coming and being a part of this service. I do have several announcements I'd like to get to you. Uh, we will have a church council meeting at 5 o'clock this evening, so if you're a part of the church council, be sure and be here for that uh, as we're looking toward uh, some planning of some things for the rest of the year. Uh, we are getting ready for our Easter egg hunt. That'll be on March the 30th. If you'd like to donate candy or plastic eggs, there's a big box uh, in the foyer. You can drop those by any time during the week or bring them on Sunday. Uh, the youth group will be filling up the, the, the eggs with the candy and stuff before the Easter egg hunt. No chocolate, it says, please. If you bring chocolate, you can drop that by the pastor's office. <laughs> um, the Center Kids Camp, uh, the deposits are due on that by May the 6th. Uh, that'll be the 19th through the 23rd. Uh, the the junior no rather the youth group is taking the trip to the ark uh, and the and the creation museum sign up sheets in the foyer for that need to be signed up by March 25th there is a deposit on that It'll be due by the 6th of May women's Bible study on Tuesday nights going through the book of First Peter uh, any of the ladies that like to come be a part of that they'd be tickled to have you there uh, also this will be the last Sunday that we'll have tickets for sale for the uh, 13th annual Hunters for Christ banquet. Uh, Miss Ann and, and Miss Kay were selling the tickets. Miss Ann will be standing out in the foyer after the service. Uh, you go by there and pick up your tickets for that. If for some reason you hadn't got tickets yet and you can't get them today, I think they will be available at the door. Uh, and any of the things that you've bought as far as the, the things that they're auctioning off and things, uh, all that's fine. You don't have to be present to win any of those. So uh, check her out after the service and she'll get you took care of. Uh, men's prayer breakfast next Sunday morning here at the church. Any and all men in the church, young men too. Uh, we'll want to have you here at 8.30 next Sunday morning. Uh, we'll have breakfast. Uh, I think somebody's going to bring a, a big bowl of cereal, and so we're just going get, to get a bunch of spoons and pass it around. We'll, we'll get one of big Audis, a uh, big bowl, fill it up, and everybody get a spoon. Just have a good time of fellowship. So, Looking forward to that. Uh, junior Youth Summer Camp, going to Clear Camp, Forest Hill, July 9th through the 13th. There is a sign-up sheet in the back, and deposit will be due on that uh, by the 28th of February. To my knowledge... That's all the announcements. Any other announcement this morning? Y'all ready to have church? Amen to that. Well, let's go, Lord, in prayer. Ask his blessing on the service today, uh, and, and we'll turn it back over to Brother Ross. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for being good to us, for the blessing, Lord, of just being able to draw another breath uh, and be able to come today and worship you. We pray that you'd bless us today with your presence as you stir in our hearts, that you'd speak to us today through the message of your word. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the privilege again that we have to come and worship, and I pray that we'd lift our voices and sing, uh, that we'd fix our hearts on your word today, that everything said and done will be pleasing in your sight. Uh, Lord, I pray that we'd be willing right now to set aside anything in our minds and hearts, to focus on your word with the intent of, of obeying, that if you say we need to do something today, I pray that we'd do it. Uh, I pray that we would, by faith, go the direction that you've called us to go as individuals and and. As a result of that, we'll be going the right direction as a church. Forgive us where we fail you. Bless us today, and we'll be careful to thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing page 579. Shine, Jesus, shine. Lord, the light of your love 
is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine fill this land with the father's glory play spirit plays set our hearts on fire flow river flow flood the nations with grace and mercy send forth your word lord and let there be light lord i come to your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance by the blood i may enter your brightness search me try me consume all my darkness shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine fill this land with the father's glory lay spirit place set our hearts on fire flow river flow flood the nations with grace and mercy send forth your word lord and let there be life as we gaze on your kingly brightness so our faces display your likeness ever changing from glory to glory here and here may our lives tell your story shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine fill this land with the father's glory play spirit plays set our hearts on fire flow river flow flood the nation with grace and mercy send forth your word lord and let there be light all right page 575 i will sing of my redeemer I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross He suffered, from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer, with His blood He purchased me. On the cross He sealed my pardon. Paid the debt and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story how my lost estate to save. Be the ransom free we gave. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer with his blood. He purchased me on the cross. Praise my dear Redeemer, His triumphant power I'll tell, how the victory given over sin and death and hell. Sing, oh sing, of my Redeemer, with His blood He purchased me. On the cross He still my pardon, paid the death. I will sing of my Redeemer and His heavenly love to me. 
He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God, with Him to be. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer, with His blood He purchased me. On the cross He sealed my pardon, paid that debt and made me free. You will stand with me. This will be offered to Him. Let's sing, Good, Good Father.
great job, Miss Chantel. Thank you for that. Brother Audie just continues to amaze me at his training. <laughs> if you have your Bible this morning, if you will, open with us the book of Joshua, chapter 24. The book of Joshua in chapter 24 is where we'll be this morning, uh, somewhat of a leaping off point. As you turn there and stand with me, if you will, in honor of the word of the Lord, uh, I'd like to read a verse to you this morning that's been somewhat our theme of the last several weeks now, as we'll be in the fifth installment this morning of a series that we've titled, The Hot Coals That We Walk On As a Church. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 28, Can a man or can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? And from that, we've thought about several ways that we as a church or we as the Lord's people tend to walk on hot coals, somewhat expecting that we won't be burned. Today, if you look with me in Joshua chapter 24, verse 14 and verse 15 is what we'll look at, and then we'll kind of catch you up as far as context is concerned. The Bible says in verse 14, this is Joshua speaking to the nation of Israel. He says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seems evil unto you this day, or unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods that your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Father, I pray this morning that you'd help us. God, to hear what it is that you've laid on our heart. I pray you'd speak today so loud and so clear that every one of us would know that we've heard from God. I pray as we do so that we do it with a humble and receptive spirit, willing God to listen and willing God to do whatever it is that the Spirit of God might speak to our hearts today. I pray that your will be done and through everything said and done, your name be magnified and we're going to praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can be seated. The hot coals that we walk on as a church. Now Joshua, many of you know and have heard of Joshua. Joshua, I would say, had one of the most difficult tasks in all of Scripture. Joshua had to follow. See, it's one thing to be the man. It's another thing to follow the man. And Joshua had to follow what could be argued is the most prolific people leader in all of Scripture in Moses. And God raises Joshua up. And Joshua leads the children of Israel over the Jordan into the promised land. And they've now dwelt there for the entirety of his ministry. And it's coming to an end. And as you've seen in our country, as you've seen time and time and again, if you've studied the nation of Israel or many other empires that have fallen, what you'll find is many times following the great blessing of the Lord is a spirit of apathy. And when apathy creeps in, then comes along uh, uh, this strange mentality that adopts different belief systems and mindsets and allows for this creeping in of, of, of bad theology and other gods, and that's what took place in Israel. And so Joshua stands at a place where this is basically his last address. Joshua led the nation of Israel into the promised land. He had proved himself. And he calls together the, the Lord's people and he wants to get one more message to the people of God one more time. And he speaks to them as God has spoken to him. You can read the, the rest of this chapter leading up to these two verses and you'll see where Joshua talks about all the things that God has done. Now I thought to myself about, we could say that, so many of us, you could say it as our country today, had all the blessings that the United States have enjoyed because of the favor of God. All the blessings that Antioch Baptist Church has enjoyed because of the favor of God. All the blessings that you and I and our families have enjoyed because of the favor of God. And so you stand at this place where Joshua reminds them of just how good God's been. And I know that none of us need a refresher course today. We all know that God's been good. And Joshua says to them all these wonderful things that God has done for them. But then he has to deal with the subject of them resting between two opinions. And Joshua says to them, if you're going to serve the gods, the false gods that caused the flood, if you're going to serve the false gods that your fathers served, that the heathens served, then you need to do so. But if you're going to serve the God of Israel, then you need to make a definitive choice today that you're going to serve the Lord. 
He didn't say choose next week. He didn't say choose a month from now. He didn't say call up the prayer chain and have them pray with you as you weigh out a decision. He says you choose today who you're going to serve. And as an example that he had given his whole life to, he says for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve God. And I thought about that in the thought process of what we're preaching these last several weeks. And I thought about these hot coals or these areas of danger that we find ourselves in as believers and, and some reason we feel like there's no consequence to us. That there's something that we can go out and we can dabble or we can play in these things and we'll not get hurt. Much like the proverb says, we can't walk on hot coals and not expect our feet to be, our feet, <laughs> our feet to be burned. Amen. We like to appeal to everybody. Amen. And so, can a man walk on hot coals and not be burned? I want you to think about this today. The hot coal of neutrality. The hot coal of being neutral. I don't know how many of you, I mean, you, you, you've got vehicles and you drive and all of that, and you, you don't have to fool with them. You know, used to when you had a standard shift and your, and your truck wouldn't crank, you could put it in neutral and, uh, or you could put it, I guess, in gear, push the clutch and, and, and get it rolling. And then you could jump off the clutch and it would kind of catch up and start. You remember that? Something about that neutral position that I got to thinking about when I was thinking about this message and I was thinking about being halted between two positions. Do you know that if you put your vehicle in neutral, that's the most vulnerable place for it to be? Because in neutral, it can be pushed or pulled in either direction. If it's in park, it can't move. If it's in drive, it's only going to go forward. If it's in reverse, it's only going to go backwards. But when you put it in neutral, it's subject to outside forces. It's subject to be influenced by anything around it. And when I thought about this and the subject of neutrality and of us as the people of God, you hear people all the time, they know what's right and they know what's wrong, but they're not going to get involved. <laughs> I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get into mixed up in all of that. I'm just going to remain neutral. I'm just going to stay out of the way and stay. Can I tell you this morning that the reason we stand as a country where we do today is because of the silence of God's people. Because when we should have spoken and we should have gone forward because of the fear of controversy or the fear of being sought as different or as one that may stir up trouble or, or, or to have a voice or to be something out of the norm, we've chosen to stay neutral. We've chosen to remove our voice and to allow those powers that be judge and move and direct us the way that they want us to go. And I'm just saying to you this morning as we look to Scripture that we're walking on hot coals when we choose to remain neutral. We're getting ourselves in a place where we're subject to being hurt and we're subject to being moved by something other than what got us to where we are today. The Bible says you can turn to uh, first, uh, you don't have to turn there, but First Kings chapter 18, you find a story of another great man of God in Elijah. And Elijah finds that the people of the Lord are now worshiping with the prophets of Baal. And they're looking to those gods that, that they worship and they're calling on the name of Baal. And Elijah comes out and he confronts those people. He confronts first the nation of Israel. And he declares to them there in verse 21 of 1 Kings chapter 18, Listen, if Baal's God, go worship him. But if the Lord is God, then you need to worship him. But he asks them this question. And it's a question we may could ask ourselves today, especially in the climate that we live in in this country, and that is how long are we as the church to halt between two decisions? If He is the Lord. Now, is, first I would ask you this morning, is that even in question in your life? Because if today you believe that Jesus Christ is God, and you believe that He is the Lord, Elijah says, follow him. If he is, if he's not, and you think there's something else that is God, then you go follow him. And then you know the rest of this story. Elijah calls together the prophets of Baal, and he says to those prophets of Baal, here's what we're going to do, gentlemen. We're going to build a couple of altars, and we're going to set up a, a, a time where you call on your God, and we'll see what he does. Then we'll call on my God and we'll see how he responds. The prophets of Baal built their altar. They jumped up and down. They spent the whole day calling on Baal. Answer us, O God. Come and take this sacrifice that they laid on the altar. Nothing happened. And Elijah began to mock them. Say, maybe he's asleep. <laughs> maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's decided not to answer you. 
And then Elijah takes his altar, he rebuilds it, he comes and lays down his sacrifice on the altar and he goes to another extreme and asks for barrels of water in a dry season to come and pour those barrels of water. They dug a trench around the altar and they filled this altar with water and he called on the name of Almighty God and the God of heaven came by fire and consumed the offering and lapped up all the water and proved that he was the Lord. And Elijah got to experience that and he got to feel that and he got to show that to the nation of Israel and to the prophets of Baal because Elijah refused to be neutral. Elijah refused to stand beside the sidelines. He was willing to be vulnerable enough to go out there and be proven wrong because he knew in his heart whether God moved or not that God was God. But he was willing to fall flat on his face if that's what it took to prove to his brothers and sisters that God was Almighty God. And he got out of the neutral zone. And he went out there and he proved that God was who he believed God to be. As you look to this passage of Scripture and as we look to a few others today, I want you to think about that subject of being neutral or this hot coal, if you will, of neutrality. And I want to ask you this question before we get into the meat of the message. Do you belong to heaven or do you belong to earth? Do you belong to heaven or do you belong to earth? And I'll say this, you can't belong to both. And if you are, in fact, a Christian today, then you've got to put it in gear. If you are, in fact, a believer, we've got to get out of neutral and we've got to do something. And what you'll find at the conclusion of the sermon today is that God would rather you be in reverse than in neutral. I want you to think about this today and what we do when we step out in neutrality and when we choose to stay neutral and we choose not to, not to be what it is that God has called us to be. The first thing I want you to think about is this. When we think about the hot coal of neutrality, one I want you to see is when we choose to remain neutral, we lose our identity. We lose our identity. So when you think about a vehicle, you think about something that gets you from A to B. But a vehicle is nothing but a glorified fort if it's not in gear. <laughs> It ain't nothing but a loud vroom and four tires that are going to always have tread if you don't put it in gear. And if we're supposed to be the church today, I want you to understand that the church has never been meant or intended to sit idle. But the church has been put here to be mobile. The church has been established to be mobilized, to be fluid to be continually moving with the work of the Lord, accomplishing that that God has put us here to accomplish. And so, beloved, I say to you one more time, when we choose to remain neutral, we lose our identity as a church. So what is our identity today? Well, one of the first things, before we ever even talk about being a church, you've got to be a Christian. Before you can be a member of a church, you've got to be a Christian. You've got to be saved. You've got to be a child of God. And as you come into that relationship and you trust in Jesus as your Savior, as we saw Wednesday night, one of the first things that you do as a believer is you follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Baptism does not save you. Baptism does not make you more saved. Baptism does not get you a closer seat to Jesus when you get to heaven. Baptism is a picture. It's a declaration. This is telling the world that Jesus took me and washed my sins away, not by a spot or a sprinkle, but He took me and submerged me in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and my account has been reconciled. It's clean. Jesus made things right in the sight of Almighty God, and then with baptism uh, uh, comes uh, with uh, with salvation and the profession of faith and baptism. Then we become a candidate for church membership. But the first identifiable quality that I would say for anybody who belongs to a church today should be that we're a Christian. And the word Christian means like or as Christ, to be as Christ was. So when you think about the characteristics of Christ, and my goodness, is there not a book full that we could go on about? Has there ever been any one person more books have been written about? You look in my office at all those bookshelves who are just covered with books and it's amazing for me sometimes to sit there and think that every one of those books is about this one. And those in my office wouldn't touch. (laughs) This church couldn't hold them all. Our property, if you stacked it ten stories high, couldn't hold all the books that are written about our Lord. (laughs) 
And when you think about the characteristics of Jesus, yes, it's so profound and so numerous. We could go on and on and on and on talking about Jesus and all the wonderful things. But if there's one thing I'd have to hit this morning as pertaining to the message of, of overwhelming uh, importance is what do we think about when we think about Jesus? Well, I think about love. Before I can think about anything, I think about Jesus and His love. And so if we're today to be Christians, and if in fact the word Christian means that we are to be as Christ, what does that mean? It means that we should be loving. Well, how much did Jesus love us? Or rather, how did Jesus love us? Did He love us like the teenagers on Snapchat love each other? Where they send a winky face and say, love you, right? Or now it's all hearts and emojis. But do they really love each other sacrificially? Do we love each other unconditionally? Do we love each other like Jesus loves us? When you think about love, how did He love us? Well, I say this, He loved us enough to die for us. He loved us enough that in dying for us, He died for us to show us mercy. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12, Paul writing as he speaks to our high priest, he says, For I will be, uh, that I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. He loved us enough to be merciful. He loved us enough to forgive us. He loved us enough not to give up on us. A lot can be learned about people by fooling with dogs. I had a guy tell me one time that the number one rule to training a squirrel dog is you've got to be smarter than the dog is. I found out a long time ago I'm not. I'd much rather spend my time uh, finding a dog that somebody else is training and just paying for it than feeding one and ended up having to haul him off or give him to somebody because he ain't worth a flip. Because I can't get one to do... You hear me when I tell you I can't get one to do nothing. I can get them to eat. I've got, I've got dogs know how to tear the trash up. If you ever got something that you think might be in your trash bag, you call me. I'll bring Susie over there, buddy. We'll get to the middle of that trash bag faster than you can shake a stick, right? I've got all kind of talent, but it's not the ones that you need. Not, not anything worth anything, right? But you know something about dogs and something about people that they kind of have in common, and that is that there's value in there, and there's value in people. I, I've seen people with hunting dogs that we gave up on that would take that hunting dog and turn him into a great dog. Sometimes with people, we give up on people. And we shrug our shoulders and we think, well, they'll never get it right. They're never going to get it straight. But somehow in the hand of God, and sometimes it takes that giving up on people for them to get to a place where they really try. But something about God not giving up on people. And you know what's funny? You look around in here this morning and, there are several cases of that. There are several of us in here who people, I can't, tell, I can't even go back to Sibley that I don't have somebody come say, I can't believe you turned out to be a preacher. You have no idea. I'm talking about people, it's amazing when people really know you and people really knew you and knew what you were. It really show you how good God is when you examine how rotten we are that God could get anything good out of any of us. And I'm just glad when I think about the love of Jesus and think about our identity as a church, an identity that we threaten to lose when we remain neutral is an identity of being like Christ. And first and foremost is Christ. We need to love each other. And we need to love God. And we need to love the things of God. And we need to continue on in God. Hebrews 13, 5, he says, I'm, I'm the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Never. That is a, that, listen, you don't have many people in your life like that. But to know that there is one who is in heaven today who loves us, loved us enough to die for us, loved us enough to show mercy so that we could be known as a Christian, wow. And he said, not only that, but I'll never leave you, never forsake you, because you're going to mess up. See, we don't want to give people an allowance to mess up, but the reality is you can't help but mess up. What we do is we characterize your mess ups. And we think somebody that messes up in what we think is bad is worse than somebody that messes up in a way that's not that bad, Right? So we think this one here has wasted his opportunity while this other one here, they can get right and get over it. We give up on people. Jesus doesn't. When you think about being a Christian today, that means that we're like Christ. When we walk on the hot coal of neutrality, we walk out in a place, we take it out of drive, we take it out of reverse, we submit ourselves to the powers of this world that can either push or pull us in any direction, and when we do so, we threaten to lose our identity as Christians. 
One of the most important characteristics as a Christian is to know the love of Christ and to exhibit the love of Christ. The second thing that I would say to you that we threaten to lose in our identity is not only our identity as a Christian, but also our identity as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because once you become a child of God and you become saved and you follow the Lord in believer's baptism and you join arms with a local church to help further the gospel and carry out the Great Commission, your number one responsibility then is following Jesus. And the word disciple is simply defined by a follower of Jesus. And I would pray today that our testimony is that we have a house full of people who follow Jesus. Some characteristics of Jesus following disciples are people who worship Him. They're people who focus their heart's goal, their affection, their love, everything that they have, they give to Jesus. But not only do we worship Him, but we're a witness for Him. We don't just go to Jesus to see what He's got for us. We take what Jesus gives us and we show the world that there's something different about the people of God. We've been studying 2 Corinthians on Wednesday nights. Wednesday night we got into chapter 9. We went through the entire chapter there Wednesday night. And it was talking about this famous verse that you've all heard that God loves a cheerful giver. Not one that gives out of necessity or gives grudgingly. And I told a story about a church that when they took up the offering and the people came down to take up the offering and the pastor said, all right, it was time to take up the morning offering that the folks in the church stood up and clapped and shouted and gave God glory for the privilege to give in the offering. That's incredible to think about. Because it's one of the highest parts of worship in our service is when we have the privilege to give. And this is not about money. It's just about where our heart is as people, as disciples and witnesses of Christ. It's our privilege to do what we do. If we're going to be an example and we're going to have an identity that brings people to Jesus, it's going to be one that when we have the opportunity to command, or rather to obey the commands of God and to do thus saith the Lord, there are a lot of things that we don't understand, but there are some things we do. And let me tell you this, you better be doing what you know you're supposed to do. I have people say to me all the time, well, I didn't really know that was wrong. Well, I believe there's grace for that. I'm the same way with my children. They do stuff sometimes that drives me crazy, but it might not necessarily be something that's wrong. But when they do something that they've been taught was wrong, would you agree with me that the punishment varies? When it's something that happens ignorantly or it's something that happens that's that's, that's, uh, 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 innocent and they didn't necessarily mean to do it or didn't mean to bring the result that they did, it's easier to move on from that. But when it's something that you've done before and you know that it's wrong and you know that God showed you it's wrong and you've heard from the Word of God, this is what you're not supposed to do and you do it. (laughs) It's a little bit different. When God says do something and you choose not to do it, we know what we're supposed to do, but we're not going to get it done in neutral. When we sit in neutral, the hot coal we walk on as a church is we lose our identity. And I want you to know something this morning, and I don't mean this. I'm not being critical. I'm just, I'm just full of love and sugar. You hear me this morning? Probably literally more than I'd like to admit. I want you to know this morning that we have in many churches across the land today lost our identity as a church. And we've driven to be more seeker friendly and because of that we've filled our buildings up with people but we've not filled them up with people that care about Jesus and people that have come to know Jesus and people that care about following Jesus. And we've sacrificed the Word of God on the altar of convenience. We've sacrificed everything that we do so much that our sermons sound like motivational speeches, our music sounds like the world's music. I'm trying not to get out too far. But it breaks my heart to know that we try so hard to look and act and be like the world that we're trying to reach the world. And the problem is the world's already the world. They don't need to be around what they already are. They need Jesus and they need people that have been transformed by the power of God that have something new in their heart, that have something new in their life, something to draw them. And when we sit neutral as a church, we lose our identity. And when we lose our identity, let's tear the sign down, pull the steeple off and call it what it is. It's a social club. And I'll quit hollering every Sunday. We'll just come in here and hold hands and sing kumbaya. Little girl one time in the nursery at Pilgrim's Rest, the nursery was right behind the sanctuary, and she, they were doing their little craft in there, and she gave it to the nursery worker, and she said, if we give this to Brother Reuben, do you think he'll quit yelling at everybody? (laughs) 
When we sit neutral as a church, we stand to lose our identity. When we sit neutral as a church, we stand to lose our influence. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus makes this statement. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, You, ye, he says to the people of God, are the salt of the earth. Listen, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Basically, he's saying that salt, when it's not used, and salt, when it's losing its, it loses its savor, it's the same as dirt. Now, nobody has a dirt sprinkler on their table. You get you a chicken breast out and sprinkle a little dirt on it. We've got salt shakers and pepper shakers, and some of you that's right with well, the Lord's got Tony's on your table. Can I get a witness? in here this morning <laughs> and we like to dust that stuff down don't we but we like our seasoning Jesus says to the church he says that we're the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its savor what's the point of salting and the, how does a salt shaker how does salt lose its savor you know some people put rice in their salt do you know why that is so that the rice will wick away the moisture because if the salt for some reason becomes watered down. It loses its ability not only to season, but also to preserve. And so what you find is, in a, in a direct understanding of what Jesus is saying, is if the salt loses its Savior, it's no good to be salted. If we lose our Savior today, it's because we've been watered down. It's because we have allowed the things of this world to water us down. You know, we've all heard the expression. You probably even remember a time when you and your walk with God was fired up. What happened to that fire? What is it that robs the salt of its savor? How do we get watered down as the people of God? Well, it's just like the Ephesians, who in the book of Revelation, Jesus really commended. But he said, I've got something against you in chapter 2 and verse 4 of the book of Revelation. He said, you've lost your first love. You left your first love. And as we sit in here this morning, we've become, listen, I ask you again, do we belong to heaven? Or do we belong to the earth? If you belong to the earth, do your best. This is as close to heaven as you'll ever be. You better have a pocket full of money. You better have a mansion on a hilltop. You better get everything you can because this is all you got. But if you belong to heaven, don't you fall in love with this world. Don't you fall in love with this world's money. Don't fall in love with this world's stuff. Don't fall in love with this world's appeal because this world's going to break your heart one day. And everything that you see is going to be gone. And everything that you work for, somebody else is going to be fighting for or wearing out. And you're going to stand before God and the only thing that's going to matter when you get there is what you did for Him. When we, when we sit neutral as a people, we threaten to lose our identity and we threaten to lose our influence and we lose our influence because we as the people of the Lord, we, we've lost the savor in the salt because we've allowed the things of the world to creep in and water down everything that God's taught us and everything that God's gave us. And in doing so, we have come, come away or pulled away from our first love, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll say this to you on the way out. We lose our identity. We lose our influence. And listen to me. We lose our impact or our ability to impact. In the book of Revelation chapter 3, as Jesus now at the conclusion of the church age writes to the church of Laodicea, Jesus says in, in Revelation 3, 14 through 20, He says, And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works that you're neither hot nor cold. You're not in drive or reverse, he says. But he says you're lukewarm. So then because you're lukewarm or because you're neutral and not cold or hot or in drive or in reverse, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth because you say I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. 
We sit today in a culture of convenience and a culture of, 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 of pleasure and we think as long as we've got what we want and we like what we hear and it doesn't make us uncomfortable that everything's all right and when we think that everything's all right on those terms we allow the Lord to, to become a silent voice in our ear and it slowly and surely pulls away from us and we become this, this unusable quality, this lukewarm water. You can't cook in lukewarm water. You can't get refreshed by lukewarm water. You're worthless. Just like a vehicle stuck in neutral. Jesus goes on and says to them, I'm counseling you to buy of me gold that's been tried with fire that you may be rich with white raiment. He says that thou mayest be clothed that thou the shame of thy nakedness not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that you may see. And I, he said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten be zealous. Therefore and repent, behold, I'm standing at the door and knocking. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. I, I don't know. Sometimes you get statements. I don't know if it's inspiration or not. I don't know if that's the right word. But I thought about something and I wrote this down and I wanted to read this to you kind of as we close the message this morning. But when you think about these hot coals that we walk on as a church and you think about getting out there and losing our identity, is there anything? could there be anything sadder than a church losing its identity or a church losing its ability to have an influence in people's lives? You think about that school in Florida and the crazy man, young man, takes a gun and goes and kills 17 people. And people say, well, where was the Lord in that? And you, you read countless stories of heroism where it would have been hundreds of people that would have been killed if it weren't for the teachers and the coaches and the people that intervened. And you realize sometimes that the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. Tragedy is the necessity of this life. We live in a fallen state. We live in a fallen place. We're going to suffer. When you want to look for the Lord, you look at how only 17 died and how that guy who went in there with more than 17 bullets didn't walk away with more casualty. It's a scary day that we're living in. And I want you to think about this. A generation that makes no impact gives way to a generation that's not been impacted. I don't know why that, that, that blistered my heart when I thought about that this week. Because you realize of all the things that we give ourselves to and that we apply ourselves to, the most important thing that we do as a church is try to make an impact. And if we as God's people have lost our influence and we've lost our ability to make an impact because we've chosen to remain neutral, because we've chosen as Joshua had to challenge the people of God, get off the fence and follow the Lord. As, as Elijah had to stand out among the prophets of Baal and scream to the people of God, if he's God, worship him. But if he's not, then follow Jesus. And as Jesus says to the church in the last days of the era of the church, He says to them, don't be lukewarm. Don't be neutral. Quit riding the fence. You realize in one of our greatest purposes as a church is to impact people. And if we in our neutral state have failed to impact people, People understand that we're handing the reins of this once great nation. We're handing the reins of many wonderful churches to a group of people that have not been impacted. And I'm so glad for the impact that Jesus has had in my life. But Lord knows I feel responsible that that don't stop with me. That we take what God's given us and we give it. It's the perpetual nature of the presence of God that we take what He's given and give it. That we take what He's given us to use and we use it. The only way we're going to make an impact is that we respond to what's impacted us. We can't remain neutral. And when we do so, we're walking on hot coals and thinking we won't be burned. Stand with me if you will. Father, we love you today. God, I praise you for your word. And I ask you, God, that you would give us a grace and a desire in our hearts to be found faithful. I pray that we not be a people that's stuck in neutral. But, God, that we're willing to get it in gear in our lives and go and do. Lord, I know of all the things that Joshua saw and experienced with these great people. 
that his heart had to be broken to see them give way to idol worship and acknowledgement of other gods. Lord, I know as Elijah stood and looked out at the people of the Lord and watched them entertaining the message of the prophets of Baal, I know that his heart had to be broken as he challenged them not to ride the fence and halt between two decisions. Lord, we find ourselves in a very desperate time today in the church, a time where we have allowed our minds and our eyes to wander. And because of that, our affection, Lord, has, has, has been given in so many different directions. And because of this, Lord, it's watered down the ability that we have to reach people. And I pray today if there's anybody in here who can agree, Lord, as I had to this week, that there are some things in our lives that have pulled us away from being wholeheartedly given to the work of the Lord. I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to listen and heed the words that Jesus speaks to that last church. That as many as you love, you rebuke and you chasten. And that we should be zealous and repent. Father, if there's one today here that's never been saved, and they don't know Jesus, I pray they'd come to Christ today before it's too late. But Lord, we pray that your will be done. And God, that through everything that we do, every response that's given, whether it be at the altar or whether it be when we go out from this place to apply it, I pray that Jesus will be at the front of everything we do and he'll be glorified because of it. And it's in that precious and holy name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. If you need to come this morning, you come.